Hello, this is Dr. James Strickler, and this lecture concerns Chapter 16, Capital and Labor, in the United States History Textbook, American Yop. Now before I get into the material in this chapter, I just need to point out something about how this textbook is laid out. The next several chapters will deal with the time period in American history from the end of the Civil War and Reconstruction up through the early 1900s. Each chapter will deal with that same time period, but it address a different set of issues within that time period. So this chapter is dealing with capital and labor. In other words, dealing with the people who own and operate businesses in America and the workers who labor within those businesses and the relationships between those two groups. As we examine the relationship between uh, the people who own businesses and the people who work for them, the first topic in this chapter addresses the nature of this in the railroad industry and how it led to a series of railroad strikes during this time period. Now the triggering event for much of this was the Panic of 1873. Panics, as the term was used during this time period, refer to economic recessions or even depressions as we would describe them from our modern point of view. So in 1873, the United States fell into an economic recession. The reasons for this are, are many and historians and economists oftentimes look back and can't put their finger on a single thing. But among the things that contributed to this recession were inflation, and speculative investments in railroads, as, as well as the demonetization of silver, which placed um, a strain on bank reserves, which plummeted by two thirds during this time period. So to put that together, what we saw happening was people invested heavily in railroads, seeing them as the coming industry. They invested so much that their investments didn't just go to the point of buying something for what it was worth, Instead, they became speculative. In other words, you make an investment for the sole purpose of eventually selling it to someone who you assume will pay a higher amount for it. And then someone comes along and they buy it from you because they assume they can sell it to someone who will pay a higher amount for it. Well, what happens with those sort of speculative markets is eventually it creates a bubble and the bubble pops. And the people that invested in it at the end of the bubble lose all their money. This then puts a crush on them to try to pay their bills. They may then make a run on the banks to try to get money, but then the banks are handing out money to all these people who lost their money and then the banks don't have enough money to hand to other people. And this can cause a ripple effect through the economy, causing the entire um, economic structure to go into recession, which is what happened during this time period. This recession lasts for several years, which put pressure both on the railroad businesses and the employees that worked for them. This pressure then led to a series of strikes. The first of these great strikes happened in 1877. It's sometimes called the Great Railroad Strike or the Great Upheaval. It began in West Virginia when employees of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad had their wages cut for the third time in only a year. Well, their concerns were shared by, people, by workers in other cities, in places like New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Illinois, and Missouri. And they went on strike too. So what it means to go on strike is the employees um, stop working for the business. And they do so with certain demands in place. We will return to work if you do a certain thing for us. And that thing in this case was to restore their wages that have been cut. Because remember, times are hard. They need this money. But times are hard for the company, which is why they cut the wages. And so we have this tension between the groups. Well, what happened was, as these workers went out on strike, they sometimes did more than just refuse to work. They would stand in the way of other people coming in to replace them. They might occupy the physical presence of the business, such as uh, sitting on the floor of a factory or climbing around on the engines of a railroad so it can't move. And in doing this, they might go even farther. 
They might start, might start destroying the equipment so it can't be used by other people. This is all designed as ways to put pressure on the business to give in to their demands before the cost of having them on strike exceeds what they are asking for in higher wages or whatever it may be. Well, as these strikes became um, more violent and destructive, they ended up totaling up to $40 million in property damage done by them. So the railroads, of course, wanted these strikes ended, but also government officials wanted the strikes ended. And that's something we'll see throughout this time period, is that in these conflicts between workers and government, the, I mean, excuse me, between workers and the railroads and against other businesses, as we'll see later in the chapter, that the um, government routinely came down on the side of the businesses. They wanted the workers to get back to work as a way to get the economy going. So what happened was, in the case of this strike, state officials um, called out National Guard units, as we would describe them today. They were called state militias at the time. Even before that, the uh, railroad or people in the community that were upset about the strike might form unofficial militias. And then eventually, even federal troops would be called out by the national government. And these soldiers of one sort or another would step in and force the strikers to back down, to open up the business so it could get going again, rather than them marching around, stopping the business from operating. During this great strike, up to 100 people, or maybe even more, were killed in unrest across the country. You can see that it took place in cities such as Pittsburgh, Reading, Pennsylvania, Baltimore, and St. Louis, where these conflicts between the soldiers that were called in to clear out the strike and the strikers ended up becoming violent, with strikers dying in all these cities. Now, this example of the railroad strikes shows how much tension there was between capital, the people that own the businesses, and the workers that work for them. As the businesses are trying to maximize profits, even during a difficult economic time, and the workers are trying to make a living, even during a difficult economic time. And their interests don't match up, there's tension, and the tension can boil over into violence. The next topic addressed in this chapter is the march of capital. In other words, the advancement of capital. Well, what is capital? Capital refers to those assets, usually money, which are invested in something. So what happened was the, the railroads were the most heavily invested business in the country. So they are a good example to start with of this chapter, which we did, of this conflict that ends up coming of with these giant investments. These giant investments allowed some people to get rich, but it may be seen at the expense of others. And this is one of the attentions during this time period. One of the things that allowed people to get rich through business was a change in the way people did business. And this can be traced back to a professor named Frederick Taylor, who studied the way that businesses operated. And he came up with a set of prescriptions that he thought could be done to make businesses more effective. Um, the, this group of suggestions became known, uh, called by him and others, scientific management, or it became known simply by the nickname Taylorism. Now, it had many aspects to it, but the most simple one to understand was what we can think of as just subdividing tasks. Okay, what is meant by that? So the way businesses, or excuse me, the way things were made historically was that you would have a craftsman hundreds of years ago that would sit in his shop and he would uh, hand make a single object and he would do all the steps of the process of making that object. He, he might cut the pieces, he might put them together, he might finish them, all this kind of stuff. Well, what was eventually realized was that those steps can be divided up among different people. So maybe you have one person cut the material, you have another person assemble the material, and you have a third person finish the material. By breaking down the tasks, you can eventually break them down farther and farther until you have individual people repetitively doing through the day one small thing over and over and over and over again, much more efficiently 
then they could do multiple things. And so if you break up the tasks that way, with each little step in the process of making th a thing done by a single person who does that step repeatedly all day long, you can make far greater numbers of the things far more quickly, more, far more efficiently. This allows the businesses to produce more, more finished goods more quickly and more cheaply, which allows them to sell them more broadly and make more money off of doing so. An example of this kind of thing, bringing success to a business, can be seen in the mechanization of the production of mechanical reapers. Previously in this course, we talked about how Cyrus McCormick invented a mechanical reaper. This is a, a tool, a, a machine that can be used for gutting, cutting down crops in a field such as wheat. Well, this is a great idea. Farmers wanted to buy these reapers. They could tow them behind their horses and more effectively harvest their crops. But there's a problem with this. Cyrus McCormick's factory produced the reapers in an inefficient way. So Hi Cyrus McCormick hired a new production manager who had actually overseen the manufacturing of Colt firearms. And he was a man who understood the nature of Taylorism, of scientific management, of subdividing, subdividing tasks. And so he reorganized McCormick's factory. And in a short time, the production capacity of that factory had quadrupled. Now this makes a big difference, not just for Cyrus McCormick. Not only can he produce his mechanical reapers more quickly and more cheaply, but now more people can buy them, which allows them to produce food more quickly and more cheaply. And this has a ripple effect through the economy, making the entire economy more efficient. These ideas of scientific management and Taylorism are built upon by the man Henry Ford, who was in the business of manufacturing automobiles. Not only did he subdivide tasks among people, but he created an assembly line in his factory where an actual conveyor system would move the partially completed cars from one person to another, just continuously moving. So you would have an individual worker and as a new car rolls up in front of him, he may put in two bolts is all, and then the car rolls away to the next person. Then another car rolls up and he puts two bolts in. Now, what's important about this is he doesn't have to go get the car to put the two bolts in. No one has to bring him the car to put the two bolts in. He, now, in a factory, when you make the thing that's being assembled move from person to person, rather than the people having to go get it and bring it, now they can work even more efficiently. This allowed Henry Ford to build his automobiles so efficiently that he could sell them at such a low cost that he had an ideal that very shortly, anybody who had a job the same level as those who worked in his, own, in his factory would be able to go out and buy their own cars. He wanted to create a system where the people working for him could even afford the thing that they were producing. Now, that may not seem like a big deal to you now, but when cars are first getting produced, they are considered to be exotic luxury goods that only the rich can buy. Henry Ford made it possible that just about any American with a decent job could buy a car. Well, through the actions of people like Taylor and Henry Ford, who made the production of uh, materials of finished products in the United States more, more efficient, the United States economy took off. It expanded dramatically within a few decades. By the time we get to the year 1900, the United States is the leading manufacturing nation in the world. And by the time we get to 1913, one third of all manufactured goods made in the entire world are made in the United States of America. These efficient production processes allow for the development of what are called economies of scale. So the basic idea of an economy of scale is that when you're engaged in these sort of repetitive production um, actions, that the big cost is the initial setting up of the factory. That costs a lot. But if once you get it set up, then each additional reaper or each additional car or whatever it is that you produce, you can actually produce fairly quickly, uh, excuse me, fairly cheaply. 
And so it actually makes sense for a business to build a big factory to then churn out as many products as they can. Because once that initial investment is taken care of, each additional thing they make costs very little. And so the bigger they are, the more of those things they can make later on and the higher profits they can make. So this is an incentive to get big because the bigger you are, the more money you can make. Now, a couple of things contributed to the possibility of actually doing this. Most of these big businesses were created as corporations. Corporations are legal entities that are set up that um, are owned by somebody, but they take the place of the owner, so to speak. Now, this is made possible because the, the corporation itself is viewed legally almost as a person that they um, have certain rights and responsibilities that they can do under the law. Now, this allows the people who set up the business by setting up as a corporation to avoid liability for the things that the corporation does. So if they set up a factory and it's a corporation and the factory ends up creating a hazardous product or the factory doesn't do well and it has to go out of business or somebody gets injured at the factory or whatever, then the corporation is to blame. And it's only the corporation's money that can be used to resolve that situation, not the owner's money. So the person sets up the corporation, the corporation does its work, and then if something goes bad, the owner is not personally responsible, only the corporation is. Now that is important. Because if everybody that set up a, a business was personally responsible for any injuries that might come from that business, they might be more reluctant to set up the business in the first place. And we wouldn't get as many businesses and they wouldn't be as aggressive doing things and the economy wouldn't grow as fast. So this protection provided by corporations is an, something that enables the economy to grow. It also makes possible for these companies to raise vast amounts of capital. Remember, capital is investment. So remember, the bigger your company is, the more money you can make. But you're going to need money to make the company big in the first place. So you need to go out and get investors. In other words, you need to raise capital. You need to raise money to then build your big factory, which then can produce the inexpensive goods that will make everybody money. You can go get those investors because you have a corporation set up, which means that when they become part owners of that corporation, they are not liable for anything that goes bad either. They're not going to lose their personal fortunes just because they gave some money to this company, which will make them more willing to give money to the company, which then makes companies more likely to be set up, more likely to hire people, more likely to, to benefit the economy as a whole. These corporations, once they're set up and they're doing business, then face a problem though. The problem is competition. What can take place is somebody can set up a similar business. And if the people running that similar business are more efficient at what they're doing, then they might gobble up more of the market and your business, which you set up, uh, may not, might not make as much money. So setting up a corporation has this danger that competitors might cut into profits or even run it out of business. And every company faces this possibility. Well, there are ways to avoid this danger. One might be that you get together with your competition and you fix prices. Now, what is meant by that is everybody within that particular business area agrees to charge the same amount for their products. Now, what that does is it enables them all to stay in business. Nobody's underselling the other one to get more business. It's a, uh, a safe way of continuing to make money. Yes, you're giving up the potential that you could be more efficient, you could charge less, you, would, might, you might earn more and put your competitor out of business, but he might do the same to you. So what you do is you enter an agreement, we'll all charge the same price, customers have nowhere else to go, they're just going to buy from one of us and we'll both make money. Another way to accomplish this, sim this similar goal of getting rid of the threat of the competition is to divide up markets. This is where you each do business in different physical areas. 
So say that there are two companies that are trying to set up businesses across the entire country. One of them might say to the other, well, how about I do all of our type of business to the east of the Mississippi River and you do all of our type of business to the west of the Mississippi River. That way customers in the east have to buy from me, customers in the west have to buy from you. And neither of us will then put the other one out of business. A third way to accomplish the same sort of thing is simply to merge together into a single business. Again, this does away with competition. If you have company A and company B who would be competitors and they instead merge and create company C and that's the only company in that area, then everybody has to buy from C, which means the previous owners of A and B who are now co-owners of C get all the profits. Everyone has to buy from them. So this is a way to avoid competition. You don't put each other out of business if you just simply merge with each other. Now, one of the things that made the poss made creating these corporations possible was, as I said, investment from other people. And you want to avoid competition once you have the businesses created. So a pathway to accomplish these things is the creation of a monopoly where one company gobbles up all the businesses in a particular area. That's what a monopoly means. That person has sole control of the market. So you might create a monopoly by owning all the railroads or by owning all the steel mills or whatever it may be. But to do that, you have to get enough money to buy out all the potential competitors. So an example of this actually happening was the creation of a steel monopoly in the United States called United States Steel. But to make that possible, the person who ended up as the owner of U.S. Steel had to get enough money to do, do it. And that was made possible by a banker named J.P. Morgan, who saw a good opportunity to invest and get a return on his investment. He would loan money to bring uh, the largest steel manufacturers, there were eight of them, all together under a single steel company. And then he would get paid back for providing that money. But in the end, you would end up having one person owning all the steel mills. And this is how capital allowed these giant corporations to form and flourish. The next section in the chapter is titled The Rise of Inequality. This is a reference to the difference in wealth between the richest people in the society and the poorest people in the society. Now, as we contemplate this, though, there's something important to remember, and that is that throughout the history of the United States, the entire population has gotten richer. So the poor people in one time period will end up being richer than the poor people in a previous time period. So everyone is getting more wealthy in the sense that they have more material possessions than what their ancestors probably had, higher quality things. Um, they have technologies that people before weren't able to get because they didn't exist, things like that. But what happens is people don't usually look and say, oh, I've got more than my grandpa had. I'm really well off. Instead, they look at the people around them and the time in which they live and say, gosh, those people have got a lot more than me. I guess I'm poor. And so as we contemplate this notion of inequality, I think it's always important to remember that it's relative inequality, not absolute. It has to do with comparing yourself to the people in the time that you are in. This age between the end of the Civil War Reconstruction and the early 1900s is sometimes referred to as the Gilded Age. This is a term that was first used by the author Mark Twain in 1873. And what it refers to is the lifestyle of the rich during this time period, how they would show off their wealth with extravagant living. Now, eventually, as you'll see as we continue on here, they ended up also showing off their wealth by doing charity work called philanthropy, giving away their riches to help the less fortunate. This inequality that existed during the Gilded Age 
was um, thought of as a conflict between the rich corporate rulers and the unskilled low paid masses. So what happened was that as society became more mechanized, as it became more industrialized, as we develop these processes like Taylorism and, and people start building these huge factories, what happened was the people at the bottom of the economic scale left the farms. They no longer tried to scratch out a living through what, what's called subsistence farming. And instead they moved into the cities to work in the factories. But remember the way Taylorism is set up, you do one little specific job and you repetitively do it all day long and it really doesn't take a lot of skill to do it, which means that you can be easily replaced. Um, there's lots of other people that can do that same job. And if you can be easily replaced in that job, then you're not going to be paid a lot to do it. So on one end, you've got these unskilled, low paid workers in unreliable jobs. But on the other end, you've got the companies that own these huge factories that are pumping out all these products that they're selling in large quantities and they're making huge profits off of it. And who gets those profits? It's the owners of the companies. The owners of these big businesses were sometimes referred to as robber barons. Now, that term baron refers to originally the people who lived in England underneath the king. They were the rich landowners who the king got loyalty from by giving them these vast estates of land. Um, so this is likening these big business owners in America to being in that same sort of social standing in our society that the barons were in, in English society hundreds of years ago. Now, the, the word robber is attached to that to imply that they didn't legitimately get their riches, that they were behaving in unethical ways, that they were immoral people, that they were taking advantage of the poor masses and in effect stealing money from them to make themselves rich. The most prominent of the robber barons were four particular men. One of them was Cornelius Vanderbilt. He now has a university named after him, um, which is one of these philanthropic things that I talked about, that these, these wealthy elite, they showed off their wealth with their extravagant lifestyles, but also with their big charitable giving. Well, one of the things he did was start a university. But he got his wealth by being a robber baron who controlled a vast network of railroads. By controlling all the railroads in this region, he was able to get all the profits from the railroads in this region, which made him an enormously wealthy man. Another robber baron was J.D. Rockefeller. J.D. Rockefeller contra controlled all the oil supply in the country, and he was likely the richest man in the world at this time. Now notice I talked about Vanderbilt controlling the railways and now Rockefeller controlling the, the oil industry through his company Standard Oil. And that's what you'll see about the richest robber barons. They controlled entire segments of the economy, what we would call monopolies. Um, a monopoly is where some individual, some, some um, corporation controls a whole economic area. Like for example, the oil or the railroads or the steel production or whatever. So if you're going to buy something, you have to buy it from them. And what happens is when someone has a monopoly, there's no competition to drive down the prices, which means they can basically charge whatever they want. If you want to buy oil, you're going to have to pay whatever standard oil wants to charge you. And all that profit then goes to J.D. Rockefeller. The third most prominent robber baron was Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie was the owner of U.S. Steel. The giant steel monopoly, which I previously told you about, had bought up all the steel mills in the country. There, there was eight big companies and then they consolidated in one with Andrew Carnegie owning them all. So he had the steel monopoly. The fourth great robber baron was J.P. Morgan. He's the one that I previously told you about, provided the money that enabled the creation of the U.S. steel monopoly. J.P. Morgan's area was finance. 
he became rich by controlling investment money in other ventures. Now, these robber barons who were called robber barons because people were accusing them of essentially acting in an immoral manner to get their riches, had a way to potentially explain why they were so rich and justify it. Now, that potential justification for their riches is rooted in the theories of Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin was a naturalist who came up with a new explanation of how species come to be in nature. This was called the theory of evolution, which he explained in his book, The Origin of Species, which was published in 1859. Now, a very rough way to think about his theory of evolution is that creatures have natural variation. Not every cat is going to be like every other cat. Not every cow is going to be like every other cow. And because they vary, some of them are going to be better able to survive than others. And those that are better able to survive are going to have a better chance of passing on their traits to another generation while those who are less able to survive are going to be less likely of passing on their traits. So in this way, some traits get passed on and some don't. Now, this variation among individuals, though, become, comes from errors, mutations. Some, uh, some cat has a litter of kittens, and not all the kittens are going to be identical. And there are going to be um, genetic mistakes that come along that sometimes create new traits. Maybe the one cat has longer hair than that species a cat normally has, or sharper claws, or whatever it may be. And if that enables it to, better, to survive better, then it's going to pass those on to its offspring. And over time, those, uh, those uh, little changes can accumulate until you have a no, whole new species come into being. So this was Charles Darwin's theory. And it was spreading during this time period as an explanation for why we see in the natural world some species succeed and some go extinct. Well, this man, Herbert Spencer, took that idea and he began to apply it to social settings. He was a biologist, so he understood well Darwin's theory. And Herbert Spencer came up with a phrase to explain Darwin's theory, to, to describe it. He described it as survival of the fittest. Well, when you apply that idea to society, to human interaction, basically what you can end up saying is some humans are more fit to succeed in our current social situation than others, and they are therefore going to succeed more, and the other one's going to fail. And that's just natural. Well, if you are a robber baron, you can then take this idea and apply it to your own success that you have achieved. This notion is called social Darwinism. And it's the idea that within a society, some people are going to be more successful, which in a capitalist system means they're going to get rich, while other people are going to be less successful, which in a capitalist system means they're going to end up being poor. And that's just the nature of things. The poor deserve to be poor because they were less capable. The rich deserve to be rich because they were more capable. So this is a justification for the wealth accumulated by people like the robber barons. And this became a common way of viewing society during this time period. That distinctions between people were just naturally occurring because some people are more capable than others. Now, I do have to say that in our modern society, social Darwinism has fallen out of favor because instead people make an assumption that all humans are equal and all humans are entitled to the same sort of opportunities. Uh, and in fact, some people go farther to think that all humans should get the same result. And if they don't get the same result, it's because somebody was discriminating un, uh, unethically against them, immorally against them. And so that's the way people want to look at things today. That is not how it was necessarily looked at by everyone back then, particularly those who believed in social Darwinism. They used it as a justification, an explanation for why some people were more successful than others. These big business people that were very successful 
had a natural um, connection with the Republican Party. The reason for this is that the Republican Party was born as a party to get rid of slavery. And a way to think about that is that they thought that people should be able to freely buy, or excuse me, sell their own labor. So no one should own you as a slave and be able to force you to work. They believe that there should be freedom in the marketplace, that if you want to work for somebody, you do. If you don't, then you don't. Well, that's an idea that goes right hand in hand with how businesses want to conduct their business. If they want to hire someone, they will. And if they don't, they don't. If they want to sell something to somebody, they will. And if they don't, they don't. If they want to make something, they will. Or if they don't, they don't. There's a freedom of, of uh, action for them that's very similar. So the Republican Party was always pro-business also. During the time of the Civil War, or in the aftermath of the Great Depression, excuse me, not the Great Depression, sorry, of Reconstruction, um, they passed very pro-business laws. And so there's this relationship that was developed. Now, what's being portrayed in this cartoon here was some critics of that relationship believed that the big business owners who were getting rich um, and favored the Republican Party for creating an environment where they could get rich would then try to coerce, try to force their workers to vote for the Republican Party to keep them in power. The next section of this chapter deals with labor. In other words, the workers organizing themselves to try to get better condition for their working. Now, I already explained about how one of the problems that laborers during this time period faced was that most of the jobs were unskilled. They were little repetitive jobs in factories that anyone could do. And the factories oftentimes replaced the, the previous little shops that would hand make things. So you would go buy a car built by Henry Ford rather than some guy in his shop trying to hand make all the parts of a car. Now that's kind of an extreme example, but it's true for just about anything. Rather than buying a, uh, a handmade pot made by a blacksmith, instead you go to some, uh, some factory that's making millions of pots and can sell them to you cheaper. Well, what this means is that the skilled laborers lost their jobs. There was no reason for them anymore. The, the assembly lines and the big factories could make the same things that they were making a lot more efficiently, which then means if they're going to get a job, they have to go work as an unskilled laborer. Even though they might have the skills to make the entire pot from scratch, they end up working in a factory doing one little part of the process instead. And so they get paid less. This is one of the things that put pressure on these workers, where they felt in some ways treated badly by the system. That in a previous time, for at least those who were skilled, they could have made more money. Now they can't anymore because the big factories have taken their jobs away. Another thing that workers faced was the expense of living in, city, in the city. Most of the factories during this time period were built in cities so that they could get lots of laborers there. Cities are where the population is. And then that caused more people to move into the cities and they grew in size. Well, anything that is in higher demand is going to go up in price. And when you have lots of people in the city now competing, trying to buy the same housing, trying to buy the same food, everything gets more expensive. So now you've got these workers going to work in these factories in unskilled jobs that don't pay them very much. But to be near the factory to work, they have to live in cities where everything is expensive. Their housing, their food, their clothing, their transportation. And this means that they have very little extra money. They may not even make enough money to pay all their own bills and survive. And this left, left them feeling that they were taken advantage of and treated badly in this system during the Gilded Age. So laborers began to try to organize together to improve their conditions. And one of the early organizations to organize laborers was called the Knights of Labor. It was an organization that invited everyone to join it, um, whether they were skilled or unskilled. They even wanted people of different genders, different races to come join the Knights of Labor. Now, it didn't always work out that way, but they were trying to gather all the workers together 
because in some ways they had sort of a radical vision, which we'll talk about later, of the laborers gathering together, gathering all their power to change society for the benefit of the laborers as a whole. They had a vision of transforming the entire society, which ends up actually getting them in trouble a little bit as we move along. Now, the Knights of Labor um, indirectly tra triggered the next big railroad strike that we want to talk about. What happened was that there was a man who worked for Gould's Rail Line Company, and he was trying to um, get together with other people for a Knights of Labor union meeting. And he got found out and he got fired for attending the, labor, the, the Knights of Labor meeting. Now, why would he get fired? Well, think about it. If you own some company and one worker comes to you and says that the, if the, you don't pay them more money, they're going to quit. Well, it's very easy to just fire that worker. Replacing one person isn't that big of a deal. What you're worried about is if they can organize together, because if all the workers in um, essence, now they would send a representative actually, but if they all in essence come into the company's office and say, we all quit unless you pay us all better, then the company has a hard question because if they fire them all, now they're going to have to have the expense of hiring an entire new group of workers and training them all to do the jobs, which is going to take a long time. And during that time, their, their company is going to be shut down and their competitors can take advantage of it to grab their customers. And the whole thing may be a disaster and put them out of business. Well, maybe it'd be better just to give those workers more money. So the key to getting more money as a worker is to organize with the other workers. Now, if you're the owner of the company and you don't want that to happen, that they come in and demand more money, then you need to stop them from organizing in the first place. And a way to do that is as soon as you hear about any of them talking about joining a union, you fire them. So what happened in that Ghoul rail line strike, I should have mentioned this on the other slide, but I already moved over to this one. And I won't move back. Is that like the strike that I told you about before that the workers walk out, they try to keep other people from going to work. And what happens is um, people in other rail lines, uh, they they support the excuse me, people in other places in Gould's rail line, they go on strike two. The strike spreads from one state to another, from Texas and Arkansas and Missouri and Kansas and Illinois. And you end up with 200,000 workers on strike for, Gale, for Gould's rail lines. Well, they can't get the rail ride going because the workers, as I talked about before, when they go on strike, they may occupy the facilities so nothing can happen. They may destroy the equipment. And these strikers start engaging in those sorts of things. And so Gould's rail line hired a private security firm called the Pinkerton Detectives to come and break the strike. And then that was supplemented by governors calling out state militias to come and break the strike. And eventually the strikers backed down and went, went back to work. Now, when I say break the strike, what I mean is these armed people come in and tell the strikers to leave or they'll be shot or arrested or whatever. And once you clear them out, then you can get people who are still working to work. Because one of the things the strikers would do is when they went on strike, they would physically prevent any workers from going in who still wanted to work. They would call them scabs. And the, the line they would set up to prevent the other workers from going in would be called a picket line. Well, these companies would bring in armed people to physically remove the picket line, physically remove the strikers so they could get back to work. Well, of course, violence broke out during this, but the way it gets reported in the newspapers at the time is that the strikers are the bad guys. They're the ones that are interrupting business. They're the ones stopping other people from going to work. And so this is the general public perception of these strikes, is the companies are the good guys, the physical force is necessary to get the companies going, the strikers are the troublemakers. So after this, this is kind of a blow to the Knights of Labor. And so they have to kind of change their focus. Now I'm on to what's on this slide. 
they back away from trying to organize society as a whole, this class of workers to rise up and set things in, as they think they should be, to instead primarily campaigning for a specific sort of change, the eight hour workday. Now, this is a common thing for us today. We understand the eight hour workday. That's what we kind of assume most jobs are. And if you work longer, you get paid overtime, something like that. But back then, people typically worked 12 or 14 hour days, maybe even 16 hour days. And so this idea of only having workers work for eight hours was a radical change. Now, this would not only be good for those individual workers, but if there's only eight hour shifts, you have to hire more workers. It sort of spreads the wealth around in order to get the work done. Now, in the end, that could end up meaning that the people who are working actually make less money. But they were trying to make a change, an overall change to make things better for workers. So they weren't basically being worked to death by their jobs that just went on and on all day perhaps every day. So eventually, these sort of worker problems and the agitation for an eight hour workday led to a cry across the country among workers, among the laborers, to have a national strike on May 1st, 1886. And about 300,000 workers or more walked out all over the whole country, maybe as many as half a million now, when they walk out for one day, that really hurts the economy that day. But it really was just sort of a symbolic gesture. They weren't walking off of work permanently, but it was a threat to the business owners that look what we can potentially do if you don't give in on this eight hour work day. Well, these labor problems continued on. And in Chicago, some workers um, went on strike and began protesting outside of Cyrus McCormick's Reaper manufacturing plant. And what happened was um, they, the leaders of this labor movement, when they were chased away from the plant, when, they, when police forces came in and broke up the strike there and said, you can't be here, they decided to hold a protest within the city of Chicago in an area called the Haymarket. It was called the Haymarket because um, early on, this was the place in Chicago where people would actually buy and sell hay for animals. So they gather at the Haymarket, it's a big crowd, the police are there, of course, to monitor the crowd, and someone sets off a bomb that kills several police. The bomb, the, the cops assuming that they are being attacked by the crowd, then fire shots into the crowd. They kill at least four people, at least seven policemen were killed by the bomb. And again, this, this thing that happened, which uh, we, to this day, we aren't sure exactly who actually set off the bomb, even though some people got arrested and convicted um, for it. We don't know for sure that it was really them. But nonetheless, this incident, this violence taking place again at a rally in via, in via, uh, involving these laborers gives the labor movement a, a black eye in the eyes of the public. The public looked at him and said, there go the troublemakers again, killing cops now. So this is problem. For, this is a big problem for the labor organizers, for the unionizers who are trying to create these labor unions so people can collectively bargain together with their employers. So that leads to the death of the Knights of Labor. They have been so associated with radical things happening that they decline as an organization and they get replaced by more moderate, less ambitious organizations. An example of this was the American Federation of Labor that comes along and tries to get people to join it, but it only wants very specific sorts of things for its workers. It wants to um, get higher wages, fewer hours, safer conditions, things like that. They're willing to go and negotiate with one plant owner at a time. They aren't looking for a giant strike across the whole country in order to um, get rid of the, the rich people and replace them with the workers being in charge, that sort of thing. By having smaller objectives, they were considered more tolerable by the general public. Nonetheless, despite the demise of the Knights of Labor, strikes continue. The next big strike was called the Homestead Strike. It took place at a 
um, at a plant in Pennsylvania. So the workers there go on strike at the Amalgamation Association of Iron, okay, it's a steel manufacturing plant, excuse me, I'm starting to speak incorrectly there. It's a steel manufacturing plant and the union of workers there called the Amalgamated Association of Iron and Steel Workers decides to go on strike. They do this because their wages have been cut. Now remember, I've talked about this before, that um, there's difficult economic times, the country had moved into a recession, the companies aren't making as much money, they still have to make a profit, and so they cut wages to their workers. Well, the workers are faced with difficult economic times too. They can't afford a pay cut. And so they organize to go on strike against the company to try to convince the company to give in and give them more money. So what happens is the plant operator decides that the strike needs to be broken that the steel workers need to be chased away from the factory. So those who are still willing to work, now remember that they've got bills to pay. They've got mouths to feed. Um, the only way they're going to stay on strike probably is if they stay united where they encourage each other to do it because they aren't getting paid. And once the strike is chased away, they'll come scurrying back to get their jobs so they can make money. That's the feeling of the, the owner of the factory, the manager of the factory. So he decides to call in someone to break the strike. The factory brings in the Pinkerton Detective Agency. I mentioned them before. They're essentially a private security firm. Now, the, the Homestead Steel plant sits on the edge of a river. And so the Pinkerton agents show up on the river by boat. And they try to get off at the docks to come in and essentially attack the strikers and move them out. But the strikers preemptively attack the Pinkerton agency on the dock. They won't let them get out of the votes and a battle ensues. And the Pinkertons eventually have to surrender to the strikers. And then they are marched through the plant and out the gate um, in a shameful display of their inadequacy. Well, that doesn't mean the strikers win though. What happens is that again, the governor of the state calls in the militia and they are brought in to put down the strike to end it. And again, the public looks at it as the, the workers were out of line, the workers were the troublemakers. The next big strike takes place at the Pullman plant. The Pullman was, the Pullman company made cars for railroad trains. So people who rode in cars were probably riding on a Pullman car. It was the biggest manufacturer of railroad cars in the company. Now, again, the strike was over cutting wages, but there was a particular feature of it that really bothered the workers. The Pullman factory that made the cars was set up in what is called a company town. This is where the owners of the company of uh, the factory, build a town near their factory where all the workers can live. This enables you to build a factory out away from towns, buy cheap land, build a factory, and then you build a town for people to move into. Um, then the company owns all the houses, the company owns all the stores, the company owns all the banks. This is convenient for the workers that they can come and work there and have a place to live. But all that does not come free. This is what it makes it good for the company. They pay the workers and then they go spend their money at the company grocery store. They pay rent for a company house, etc. So the company gets the money back. Well, what happened was the Pullman company cut the wages of the workers by a quarter. So imagine that you are making $4 an hour. Now you're only making $3 an hour. But it kept the charges in the company town for the rent for the houses, for the utility payments for, you know, the, the gas or electricity or water or whatever was coming into the houses. They kept that all the same. So they were going to continue to try to make the same amount of money off of the workers without paying them as much. Well, this, of course, upset the workers and they went on strike. Another union involved in the railway industry, the American Railway Union, went on a sympathy strike. This means that they were not directly striking against their own employers to get something new for them. They were striking on behalf of the Pullman employees. Now, how would this work? Well, by going on strike, they make things bad for their own company owner. 
But what their own company owner can then do is he can call up the owner of the Pullman company and say, hey, uh, you need to settle with your workers so my workers will go back to work and I won't be hurt by it anymore. So this is a way to try to get the wealthy people, the owners of these corporations, to put pressure on each other to help the Pullman strike come to an end. The leader of the American Railway Union that organized this, this sympathy strike for the Pullman workers was a man named Eugene Debs, and he is going to come up again later in our story. So what happens then is the Pullman strike, like the other strikes before it, is put down. They bring in militia people, but eventually President Grover Cleveland gets involved, and he sends federal troops in to end the Pullman strike. Now, like on all the other strikes I've told you before, the, the strikers are viewed by the general public as the bad guy. Those who break the strike are viewed as the good guy. And so the president of the United States sending troops in to physically stop people from striking was viewed as a good thing during this time period. It wouldn't be in our modern world. Um, unions have become much more powerful. People have generally become more supportive of unions than they were back then. And even if they're not, the idea of the president violently sending in troops to end a, a strike is something that people would gasp at today. But it was a normal thing to have back in the, to have happened back then. Eugene Debs, who uh, had the other railway union strike in sympathy of the Pullman workers, which, by the way, I didn't mention this when we were on that slide. The way that they went on strike was they refused to do any work with any train that had Pullman cars. Well, Pullman cars were the most common kind of train car. And so that meant that they were not, they were refusing to work with a lot of trains. Okay, so Eugene Debs, the leader of that sympathy strike, ended up being thrown in prison. And the reason was, was because when he was first contemplating the idea of telling his union to go on strike also, um, a judge, a federal judge, issued an order telling him to not do that, to not have his union go on strike. And he refused to follow that order. He ignored it. He told his union to go on strike anyway. He ended up being arrested and thrown in prison for it. And this radicalized Eugene Debs. This made him um, believe that the government, in this case represented by the courts, would always side with the big businesses, like the railway workers, um, and that because of that, the workers could not work with them anymore, that there was a more radical change that was needed, back to sort of the ideas of the Knights of Labor, but even going beyond that. He wanted to totally redo the government of the United States. He became a devoted communist and wanted to see a revolution in America that would bring communism to our shores. So part of what is going on during this time period is you can see common people, workers like in these strikes, who are feeling oppressed by the rich, the wealthy class who owns the businesses, who runs the companies. And they want to have some way to rise up against that. Well, that ends up leading to a movement called the populist movement. And that word populist is referring to the people, the population, the common folk who try to rise up to politically change America. The roots of this are found in the agriculture industry rather than among the, the strikers at these, um, at these companies that I've talked about before, like the railway companies and the steel companies. Now, why does it begin with agriculture? Because agriculture has dramatically changed during this time period too. It has become commercialized. Now, what is meant by it being commercialized is that um, you can no longer just be a little farmer raising food for your family and selling a little bit to your friends and neighbors and really make any money. Because these same principles of trying to mechanize things and make them more efficient are happening on farms too. Farms get big, they hire employees, they buy equipment, things like that. 
They go from raising many crops to raising one kind of crop and doing it very well, harvesting vast numbers. Of economy is a scale that we talked before about manufacturers that works with farms too. This becomes the most efficient way to raise agricultural goods and make money off of them. But to do this, you need money, which means you're going to have to go get loans from banks to buy the equipment, to buy the more land, to buy the more seeds to run a bigger farm. And then what happens if your crop doesn't do well enough? Well, then you can't make the bank payments and they may come and seize your farm. So farming has been commercialized. It's become something about raising big numbers of crops and selling them, uh, harvesting with mechanical means and, and selling them on markets that cover the whole country. But at the same time, it becomes precarious for the individual farm, farm owners. Um, they now are in debt in order to do what they're doing. And if their crop doesn't come in well enough, they can't pay that debt. So this causes the farmers, kind of like the workers in the factory, to feel like they're being used by the rich people. And they want some way to fight back. So they form a farmer's alliance, a way for them to potentially work together to try to negotiate better deals for these things. So rather than one guy going to a bank and asking for a loan, the farmers as a whole can say to the bank, we need you to give us better deals on loans, that kind of thing. If uh, they need to buy seeds rather than them buying them by themselves, they can get together and buy seeds together. And by buying more, they can get them cheaper, that sort of thing. So they're trying to figure out ways to work together. And one of the most important ways that they learned to work together were through cooperatives. This is where the farmers could pool their resources to buy things together at cheaper prices. And so they would set up things like this farmer's cooperative store where they would all put money in to go buy the materials that they need to farm. And then that way they could buy these things cheaper from their cooperative store. They are pooling their resources to compete in this new, more competitive commercialized environment. Now, some of them took it so far as to believe that this organizing of them as farmers could eventually lead to what they called a cooperative commonwealth. The idea that they, just common everyday folk, farmers, could work together in a way that would make them self-sufficient. They wouldn't need the rich people anymore. And if they could do it, then everybody in society could do it. All the workers could do it. They could all just work together, not need those blood suckers that work for the banks and the big companies draining wealth from them that they could cut those people off as kind of a parasite upon society. This is a view that is very similar to communism, as I will explain later. But it doesn't lead to right that now them, them standing up and proclaiming that they're communists like Eugene Debs. That's still kind of a dirty word in the United States. So what they do instead is they form their own new political party. It is officially called the People's Party, but most often people refer to it as the Populist Party or referred to people who followed it as populists. These are people who wanted to use the mechanisms of government to collectively protect the farmers and the workers. This People's Party that which formed out of the Farmers Alliance held its first national convention in 1892 when it could, they could decide on a party platform, the issues upon which they stand, and nominate somebody to be their candidate for president. What's important right now is to talk about what they voted on at this convention to be the basic views of their party on essential issues. At the Omaha convention, they created a platform. Platform just means this is where we stand on the issues that called for the nationalizing of railroads and the nationalizing of telegraph systems. In other words, the government would come along and buy up all the railroads, buy up all the telegraphs. Remember, those are the wires that were strung all over the country, which allowed people to communicate through Morse code in real time. So the government would own them. And the idea was that way they can't charge so much money for us to use them. The people would think, well, the government works for us. The government now owns these companies, which means the companies now work for us. 
The Omaha Convention also called for the direct election of senators. Now remember that senators were originally under the Constitution chosen by state legislatures, and that was still the way at this time. But they wanted the senators elected by the people to make the United States Senate responsive to what the populace wanted, what the people wanted, rather than maybe what the elites in the state legislature wanted. They also wanted a graduated income tax. And that just simply means that as you make more money, you end up paying more in taxes. This is opposed to a flat tax where everybody in society might pay the same amount or at least the same percentage of their income. And then finally, they wanted sub-treasuries. Now that's kind of a weird name to describe it. What, what they were thinking of as was government operated warehouses where they could store their harvested agricultural crops for free until they got a good price in the market to sell them. That way, if they harvested so much wheat or whatever it is on their own land that they didn't have room to store it on their land and therefore were forced to sell it for whatever the price was right now, they could instead store it in these sub-treasuries and wait until the price went up and then sell it. Now, of course, they didn't get everything they wanted on that party platform, but you may have recognized that some of the things that they did want eventually came about, such as the graduated income tax and the direct election of senators. Now, they had reason, this populist party, officially called the People's Party, they had some good reason to think that they might be growing into something really big in the future. In the 1892 presidential election, their candidate, um, actually won a few of the states, the ones marked in green on this map, and got a few of the electoral votes. Now, he didn't come close to winning, only getting 29 electoral votes, but it shows that this party was competitive. And then in 1894, when congressional elections were held, they actually had three senators who said they were populists who got elected to the United States Senate as well as getting at least seven representatives elected to the House of Representatives who um, believed in this populist attitude. A reason why people looked to the populist party during this time period was because of the panic of 1893. Now remember a panic, we're talking about an economic recession. This one may have been triggered by a collapse in wheat prices and the hoarding of gold during this time period. But whatever the reason, we entered a recessionary time, which means that people begin to struggle more, which means they look around for help and they see the populist party saying, we're here to organize you against the big rich people to help you out. So that could explain their success during this time period. But remember, they started out as a farmer's alliance that eventually grew big enough to form a political party. Now, I point out that they started as a farmer's alliance because there's one little bit of this history that I need to point out before moving on. And that is that the farmer's alliance was segregated. Only white farmers were allowed to join. Well, in response to that, black farmers formed their own colored farmers alliance to try to do the same sort of things, to organize together, to strengthen each other, to um, bargain for things collectively as they tried to buy things for their farms. But this farmer, this colored, as they put it, farmers alliance was not very successful because there was a lot of racism at the time that eventually put pressure on them and caused them to disband as an organization. Well, during this time period, as the populist party is sort of enjoying its heyday, there were some people that believed that it would eventually devour the Democratic Party. That's what's being depicted in this cartoon. We have a snake that says populist party on its side, and its head is the, the look of one of its prominent politicians swallowing the Democratic Party. This did not happen because the Democratic Party saw that the populist party was very popular with some people who they needed to be Democrats if they were going to win elections. And so the Democratic Party altered some of its views 
to embrace the ideas of the populace, to get the populace come, to come over and be Democrats who had a better chance of winning. And this did happen, which eventually led instead to the death of the populist party. So what kind of issues did they um, co-opt? Things like direct election of senators and also a, um, a graduated income tax. Those kind of things eventually became the law in this country under the efforts of the Democratic Party rather than the Populist Party. A background to these political conflicts is the politics of gold. Now, I need to talk just a little bit about the importance of gold before moving on. Our monetary system during this time period, our money system, was based on gold. So gold is a valuable resource, but there's limited quantities of it. And because there's limited quantities, it holds its value. So what that can then happen is you can tie other things to gold to get them to hold value too. In particular, you can tie paper money to gold to get it to be valuable. And I'll explain more about that in just a moment. But before I do, I have to point out one of the most prominent political figures during this time period, a man named William Jennings Bryan. He was a lawyer from Nebraska who ended up becoming a significant politician. As a lawyer, he was best known for being the defense attorney during the Scopes Monkey Trial, when a teacher in Tennessee was charged with teaching evolution. And William Jennings Bryan came in and defended him, and it was a famous trial all over the country. Gave William Jennings Bryan a big name. He used that then to get into politics, and he was magic there. He was considered one of the best public speakers, or you could call them an orator, in American history. And during this time period, what he went around speaking about was an issue he had with gold. So the country lived under the gold standard, which I already explained meant that you could tie dollars to the value of gold. Now, the way you would do this is a, a note would be created by the government that would say that if you bring this piece of paper back to the treasury, we will give you uh, an amount of gold stated on the certificate here. So let's say each gold coin is worth a dollar and you get one of these notes for a hundred dollars. You could show up at a uh, government treasury and exchange this for a hundred gold coins. Now you wouldn't do that because gold coins, uh, uh, they're heavy to carry around with you. They're a very tempting target for people to come steal. So instead you leave your gold coins at a bank and you just get a piece of paper to represent them. That's what paper money really was. It's, that's why I say was because it's not anymore, um, but it was just a representation of the gold that it stood for. Now, because the gold is stable in its value, because we're not finding a lot more gold to flood the market and pull down the price. This then means the dollar is stable in its value. And a lot of people liked it that way and they wanted to keep it that way. But there were challenges to this idea. The challenges were called the free silver movement. What the free silver movement argued for was that anybody could bring any silver into a US mint, that's where they create the money, and ask that their silver be stamped out into silver coins that they could then spend. This was called free silver because you wouldn't have to pay to get your silver converted into money. Now, did people have silver? Yes. Not only were there mines in the United States during this time period that were discovering more and more silver, but also people just walking around might have silver. Might be some sort of family heirloom they've never gotten rid of. But silver is out there and there's even more coming all the time from newly discovered mines. Out in the West, particularly Nevada, there were silver mines. Well, the free silver led some people to advocate for a bimetal system. And what they mean by that is that um, either gold or silver could be used as legal money in the United States. Now, this presents a problem. 
and that is that if you suddenly allow silver to be printed out in coins and that it can be used in the United States to pay bills, then what that's going to do is it's going to elevate the price of things. You don't want that when the country's in a recession, but it would have that effect because um, as you put more silver in there, now there's more money. If there's more money, then um, anything there's more of, the value of it will go down. Silver then becomes less valuable. Gold becomes more less valuable, which means that means now you need to spend more gold than previously, more silver than previously to get the things that you want. Some people like the idea of silver flooding into the market to make the make money less valuable because this is a way for people like the farmers to potentially get out of their debt. So let's say you're a farmer and you take out a loan for, uh, we'll just use a rough number, um, $10,000 for your farm. And then a few years later, you're having trouble paying off that loan. But now what would have cost you $10,000 back then actually costs $20,000. So your farm has actually become more valuable. But another thing has happened, and that is everything you're selling, you're selling it for more because inflation happens all across the, the economy, which means now you're making more money off of the things that you're selling, but you still only owe the $10,000. So now it's less of a burden to pay off that loan. So inflating excuse me, inflation, which raises the price of everything because the value of the money goes down, can help people that are far in debt. Who it hurts is the people who are trying to pay bills right now at the newly inflated prices. It helps you to pay off things that you got in the past that are cheap. It makes it harder to buy things in the present that are more expensive. So it became a debatable issue for some people about whether this would be a good or a bad idea. And generally the common folks who were in debt were more supportive of having silver as a kind of money that you could go freely take, you could get freely coined from silver coming out of the mines in Nevada or from uh, your grandmother's silver spoons or whatever. You could take the money in to a US mint and get it coined, that's what free silver meant and you could have this additional money. They thought that was great to enable people from these lower classes to pay off their debts. So in the midst of this, the political parties, um, it comes time for them to nominate their candidates for president. And at the Democratic Party's National Convention, Williams, William Jennings Bryan gets up to give a speech. This famously becomes known as his cross of gold speech. In the speech, he's talking about this idea of free silver and being supportive of it. He's coming from this populist tradition, which the Democratic Party has adopted. And in the speech, he says, having behind us the commercial interests and the laboring interests and all the toiling masses, we shall answer their demands, the people who want to keep a gold standard and not have free silver, we shall answer their demands for a gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. So he's invoking the imagery of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to say that the people who want free silver will become martyrs if the gold standard is maintained. And so to avoid that evil of turning them into martyrs, that instead we should no longer just have a gold standard, but we should move to bimetallism. Well, his, well he ends up that, that, that speech that William Jennings Bryan gave is loudly cheered at the convention. And he gets the nomination of the party to run for president. His opponent for the Republicans is William McKinley who campaigns on the opposite premise. You can see in this campaign poster for him that he's actually standing on a gold coin. And he's saying that we need prosperity, commerce, and civilization, which we're gonna have by maintaining the gold standard. 
maintain the gold standard then means that there's a limited supply of, of gold, which means its price stays stable and all the money tied to it stays of stable price too, which he thought would allow people to better do business with uh, more security and it would make the country more prosperous. Well, William McKinley wins the election. The free silver movement is rejected. And because of this, um, uh, short time later um, in the next uh, shortly before the next election um, the United States Congress passes a new law called the Gold Standards Act in which they make it permanently legally set they thought permanently it doesn't turn out to be true that we would have a gold standard in the United States only no no free silver no turning the silver into silver coins, no going to bimetallism, which would reduce the value of dollars. Now, as I have discussed these conflicts during this time period between capital and labor, I previously alluded to that some of more the more extreme views of the people on the side of labor could be thought of as like communism. And that's what I want to talk about now about socialism in the United States. Socialism and communism are very similar, and I'm not going to go into the details right now. They're just different stages on a road of development from a certain philosophical perspective. People who we might call communists might well call themselves socialists. And there were a lot of them during this time period in America at least a significant enough amount that they were having an effect on American politics. Now, before I explain um, the sort of high watermark of socialism in the United States during this time period, I need to be sure that everyone understands what socialism actually is. It's a political theory invented by a man named Karl Marx, a German. And basically what he thought was that, the, that history was about a conflict between the upper class and the lower class, with the upper class, the rich people, taking advantage of the poor workers. But there would eventually come a time, he believed, where the poor workers would decide we aren't going to take it anymore. And they would rise up against the rich elite. They would seize all the factories and other means of making money. They would kick the rich people out, they would take them over themselves, and the workers would own all the means of production. And it would become a worker's paradise, where because the workers then own the factories, they would pay themselves good wages, and nobody would be getting rich, just everyone would be living about the same. This was the paradise that he wanted to create, the utopia he wanted to create. And he had a slogan in one of his most important works where he said, workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains, is what he said. And so this is about uniting the workers, like they do in labor unions and things like that, to try to rise up against the people with money that are over them. Now, he takes it a little farther than just a strike where you're maybe just trying to get more money from your employer. He thought that the workers would actually permanently take over the factory and kick out the owner. Well, this view gets traction with people in America like Eugene Debs, who becomes the leader of the Socialist Party of America. Yes, there was a Communist Party in America during this time period. And he runs for president as the leader of this Communist Party. They called them socialists, but if you know anything about politics and that, you can essentially think of them as communism, communists, and it's about the same. He runs for president several times and does his best in the election of 1912 when he gets 6% of the vote in the country. Now, this is a pretty remarkable thing. He doesn't come close to winning, but it shows that at least 6% of the people in the country believe that during this time period, believe that we should become a communist country. This is where the labor unit is, is involved with and the populist movement. It's all part of this entire group of people with varying political points of view who believe that in one way or another, labor, the workers, need to rise up and get more from the rich elites. 
And that completes the lectures for this chapter 16 in American Yop.